going to start out with uh, the disable your ringer thing because I like to do that. Just it's a power thing for me. Um, but uh, the most important slide is coming up next, and I want you guys to really pay attention because there is going to be a test, and there is going to be if you get a passing grade, there is going to be a giftage. Oh. So this is all about me, and I, I do want you to pay attention. Um, I was basically a nerd from birth. Uh, we figured that I was dropped multiple times. Uh, we were in a farm area, so who knows what could have happened. Um, my big thing was uh, flashlights and pens for birthdays and Christmas. I uh, really liked that. I made my mom drive me to Radio Shack every Saturday, religiously. Uh, I wore plaid pants and striped shirts um, and had the dork haircut. And you can see there's actually an illustration here. This is a picture of me in uh, high school. And I think that that fits quite nicely. Achievements, I did get a bowling trophy at the age of 12, which is very cool. Um, I was the very first boy to ever take typing in my school. It kind of GPF the entire system, and uh, it certainly was a great way to meet girls, but I had no idea what to do because I was a nerd. Um, where things started to take a more serious turn is uh, I bought one of the very first Radio Shack TRS-80 computers. And I started controlling stuff in my life uh, as a teenager. Started controlling things in my bedroom. Uh, started controlling lights and radios. And uh, it was a bizarre thing. So <laughs> now, here we are 30 years later. And we have uh, a few systems installed. You'll see here. That's our, uh, that's our installed base. There's actually, uh, the latest count is about 18,000 systems installed. About 7,000 digital channels. and. Uh, I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, it was interesting in the fact that uh, the goal wasn't to get big, wasn't to do all these things. The goal was to design to, you know, cool stuff to solve problems for people. And so you know, maybe that's life's lesson number one, is you know, do things that you're passionate about and do things that are, you think are cool, and hopefully somebody will agree and uh, take part with you. Um, we serve a, a wide variety of industries, certainly. Um, your area, which is the public uh, access, educational access, and government access, the PEG, is very, very important to us, uh, and we've done a lot together. Um, campus communications, onboard communications, which is ship, ship bound, cruise ship uh, uh, mm -hmm. video, because everybody knows this is like the very first tough question for you. When a couple goes on a cruise, 50% of that group didn't want to go. Right? And so there's the one that's all giddy and excited and gets the, you know, the, and, and it can go either way out of the couple. And so, strangely enough, my company, we do a lot in the cruise industry of generating TV channels aboard the ship for the other person to watch. Uh, so that's kind of what happens there because the satellite footprint and bouncing around doesn't work out so well. Uh, medical facilities, religious broadcasters, correctional facilities. Um, that's another interesting one. Back in the year 2000, Electronics got a, a letter that was uh, certified from the uh, California Department of Corrections, and it was very serious, and it said, uh, we want to make sure that your Mini-T Pro won't fail at year 2000 because the state of California considers it to be mission critical, literally. Uh, I thought it might have been a mistake or a joke, but sure enough, we followed up, and it turns out that if the movie channel goes out in prison, they have serious issues. <laughs> and so they were dead serious, and I'm, I'm glad to say that the uh, Mini-T didn't fail. Private communities, uh, corporate communications, uh, military things, Homeland Security, and uh, uh, hotel, motel, resort, those are all areas that Electronics serves, but uh, we're here today to talk about PEG. And so, you know, what is it all about? Um, there's just several things on here uh, that I think each one of these will strike a chord at some point in your program schedule and some point of uh, what you're up to so far as your facility. But we, we do have a purpose. Uh, we don't go in just to see what shows up and then distribute it. We, we want to be purposeful about what we do. And uh, so today we're going to be talking about mobile apps, which uh, Keith did a great job on. We're going to be talking about Roku and what's OTT? Who knows what OTT is? Wow, okay, cool. No, no OTT, yeah, no, okay, me. great. We have a wrap of OTT, <laughs> but all right, OTT is over the top. Now, we touched on this in what Mike was talking about. 
Um, over the top means that we're kind of going around the cable provider. We're kind of going over the cable provider. And it's a slippery slope and there's some nuance that you guys have to understand because as Mike said, your franchise fees come from the delivery over the classic cable system and uh, over the top bypasses all of that. And so we're going we're gonna to get into that in a bit. Um, relative to what Keith was talking about, mobile apps, you know, they are everywhere. And it's not just mobile. And this is one of the things that, that we didn't talk about that I want to I hear what Keith has to say about this. Um, certainly we're aware of mobile apps in our handheld devices. That's a given. But who's thinking about mobile apps on their uh, TV at home? Right. Uh, what are we starting to see where these televisions are actually starting to integrate the set-top box, they're starting to integrate you know, the processors, the computers, and, and literally if you look at Samsung and LG, you're seeing where they're actually doing apps on your televisions. Um, and so much as Mike was talking about with the smart grid, I mean, God forbid your refrigerator, you know, you download the I want my ice cream colder mobile app, uh, you know, to override what uh, the LG refrigerator manufacturer did. But those kind of things are coming. And the connectivity uh, is just unbelievable. Um, you know, we did a, a, a quick sweep at our house, and, and I don't have any connected uh, appliances. Um, my house is pretty generic in that regard. But so far as nerdism, uh, you know, we kind of tip the scales. And I looked, we have about 70 IP addresses running around in our house, and none of that is abnormal stuff. You know, TiVos and, and just printers, you know, and all that. It's pretty insane when you think about it. Um, so, you know, I wanted to pass this around, but Deb and Elizabeth already got their fingerprints all over it, so you probably, probably want to wipe this down, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, we have the Roku here. Focus, focus, yes. We have the Roku XS, uh, XS here, which is a pretty uh, crazy uh, device. And when we talk about apps, sure enough, uh, this actually executes a certain form of apps. And we're going to demonstrate over on that screen a little bit later on um, what we've done that's specific to your particular life. And so let's go ahead and pass this around. I, I would like to see it come back at some point. <laughs> There's the remote for it. Yeah, you know. But how many of you have a Roku? Wow, okay. Just a couple have a Roku. How many of you, uh, by a raise of hands, have ever seen or played with or know of someone that has a Roku? So more of you. But it still isn't the common, like, Kleenex or Xerox, right? You know, it, it's not that kind of thing. So we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But let's hit, uh, let's hit over the top. And hopefully this jives with what I had uh, said earlier. Um, it's the uh, online delivery of video and audio without the internet service provider, Comcast, Verizon, whatever, being involved in the control or distribution of the content. So when we say over the top, we're going around them, over them, and uh, it's kind of a direct channel to the service provider. Um, so per Mike's or, uh, uh, presentation, What's the next <laughs> shoe to drop here? Go ahead. They're going to just basically the to take up the difference. Right. <laughs> They're going to bandwidth limit us or charge us over. To, and how many of you know Verizon, uh, you know, the whole free, uh, no, no limits thing? They're kiboshing it even if you're grandfathered. Um, we all know that, and I'm not making any crazy predictions, but we all know that we're being set up, whether it be, you know, 0.032 cents per Google search or this much per tier of bandwidth consumed on our phone or at home, we're being set up to pay for what we've been enjoying for free for so long. And so we have to be careful and, and be mindful of the over-the-top pitfalls because, you know, if, if uh, Netflix, which represents a ton of the Internet's bandwidth, if all of a sudden Comcast and all the other internet service providers said, okay, we're going to tier your charges, all of a sudden the freeness of over the top doesn't uh, look so free anymore. So uh, how many of you had a local Blockbuster store in your neighborhood? Does this kind of uh, indicate what happened to Blockbuster in your neighborhood? It's, uh, it's an interesting thing that kind of happened in front of our eyes. You know, when... When I'm uh, driving with my kids, I'm always, you know, every moment with my kids is a teaching moment. And so um, 
or, uh, if you've ever seen along the highway or, or where we have construction, it's not that much in Michigan, but you know, we do have construction occasionally. <laughs> no, I'm just being, yeah. um, those arrows. How many of you have noticed that you have those lighted arrows, you know, that go to, 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 to tell you to change lanes? And not many years ago, those lighted arrows were incandescent bulbs and there was a little diesel generator just, just putting around. And then all of a sudden, overnight, no more generator, batteries, LED, solar panel. And I, and I tell my kids, I say, you know, I hope that the company that made that diesel generator, just kicking them out like no tomorrow, was aware and was thinking. The same thing with CRT, picture tubes, you know. How many CRT televisions can we buy these days? Not very many. And there's this big paradigm shift. And certainly, you know, I, I can't fault Blockbuster for not being predictive of the slope of that decline. That's just radical and crazy. Here's another radical and crazy thing. Um, this is actually from a, uh, uh, some information from Roku. And uh, you can see that, you know, when they started out with the Roku players in 2009, there were hardly any channels. And look at the number of channels. If I could just kind of bend over here. There's probably double that now. Like, again, this information, especially when you have that kind of slope, dates itself very quickly. And then look at the number of hours streamed. Um, you know, that means that that is time being stolen from satellite or cable or, you know, other um, delivery methods. Now here comes the fun part. You know, I'm going to have to add Keith's name to this uh, list here. There are thousands of companies that now want to be part of that solution, part of that delivery method, um, whether it be they're going to uh, provide apps or they're going to provide uh, um, DRM, you know, security layers or that sort of thing, and, and it's pretty incredible. And so as with any brand new area, you just have everybody flooding in. It's really the equivalent to an electronic gold rush. Um, some of the challenges that we face with over-the-top and delivery such as this is, of course, uh, we have a wide variety of target devices. And in the good old days, none of you, none of you really felt my pain, and I'm going to share my pain with you now, but back in the good old days of VHS tape machines, when we were controlling your tape machines, I don't know what's wrong with you people, but you wouldn't all buy the same brand and the same model. <laughs> And hence, at Latronics, we have shelves of all these different brands and models of tape machines that we had to develop interfaces because, sure enough, you know, if we said, yeah, we have an interface for a Sony 200, she would call up and say, well, I have a JVC 300. And it was like, well, we don't have an interface for that. Well, if you want me to buy your thing, then you're going to have to interface it. And so we literally have this huge you know, shelving system full of those tape machines. Well, that's a great analogy to today. Even though a lot of us think about the iPhone, we think about the tablet, the iPad, we know that there's Android out there. There's also now the new Windows uh, 8 phones and that sort of thing. There's a ton of other phones still out there uh, that are media enabled. And the bad, bad news, and Keith, uh, in, your, in your work through all this, uh, if it's Android, is it always the same across all platforms? Oh, yeah, every time. Yeah, no, just... exactly. He was being sarcastic, just so you're clear. And I'm just like, I just got an email saying there's a whole bunch of problems in Android. I mean, it's, it's right. a nightmare. Right. Yeah. It's, it, and, and, and really, the same thing we've experienced even in iOS on the Apple side. There's things that work on an iPad that don't work on an iPhone that, you know. So that is the challenge. And quite honestly, a lot of the big players are kind of setting back and waiting for the dust to settle. And uh, at the same time, we all want to move forward. Um, so I think we're all familiar by virtue of the presentations today and the information that we've gathered on our own about, uh, uh, you know, uh, create you content. Yeah, no, content you create. Um, that, that's something you're good at. You gather it from the community. You bring it in. You, you make your own awesome content. Uh, and then, you know, you know that you have viewers out there. The killer is, is the stuff in the middle, um, right there. And, and that's the thing that we're all faced as a challenge. What was the stuff in the middle, like today, if you're pumping out over UVerse and Comcast, then what is the stuff in the middle? Who's the stuff in the middle? Anybody? I just said it. 
It's Comcast and Uverse. Right? They're the delivery method. They're the thing in the middle. They're between your content and your viewers. Right? And so um, the problem is, is that we're looking at, at the shift. How many of you, by a raise of hands now, are doing any form of streaming? Wow. Okay, that's a bunch of people. Were you thinking about streaming five years ago? It, it wasn't, it, oh, Tom. <laughs> He's just a dreamer, you know. Why do you not paying for Right. Right. And, and, you know, that's the thing, though, is that all of a sudden, one day you woke up and you realized you had to stream, right? And yet, uh, it was just this added burden, this added thing, and there's a lot of peril. How many of you think streaming is just a walk in the park? Not, not anybody, because it isn't, because you have to convert the video, which is called an encoder. You have to deliver it to the Internet, and then... There's this dirty little secret in the industry, and I've harped on you guys for probably at least three or four years about this one. Um, when somebody tells you that you're going to stream to the world from within your facility, I'm going to force you to do the math today. Um, let's just go through it. So I'm going to get complete techno dweeb nerd on you here. Uh, let's say that your video stream is a conservative and low 300 kilobits per second. Let, let's go to 500 to make it super easy. So if you have each stream is 500 kilobits and you have one user, one viewer watching the stream out of your facility, then how much bandwidth have you used up out of your facility, outbound? 500 kilobits, right? Now you have two. Okay, that's a megabit. Now you have three. That's 1.5 megabits. Four, two megabits. Okay, now the thing is is that a lot of us, uh, you know, from our cable companies will see that they talk about, oh, here's your 30 megabit service, your 20 megabit service. That's 30 and 20 megabits what? Down or out? Down or up? It's usually down. And then in fine print, it says, yeah, you've got two megabits up. Well, how many viewers would you have in that? You'd have four. Now, some of you, maybe, <laughs> that's a great number. Most of you know. You know, you want to have, and that, by the way, would crash your network. Uh, that fourth viewer would come on, and all of a sudden, Google searches and email wouldn't be so happy. So that's a kind of a, a you know, a crazy exaggeration overview. But the thing is, is that when you consider streaming within your facility, there's a lot of pitfalls relative to that. And so what most of you have to do is you have to use what's called a content delivery network. And that actually is a reflector. So you have one stream that leaves your facility, one 500 kilobit stream that goes out. It hits this stuff in the middle, this content delivery system, and then that's what multiplies and amplifies. And that, that's something that isn't simple. It's servers and bandwidth and just crazy stuff. And so uh, it's important that you realize that. Um, and so that was the point here. The stuff can be very expensive. You have just all these things, all this technology, you can actually create a whole other universe in just delivery of content. 